This week on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. I could see it was a Tandon Brown MiG-21. The missile impacted after the wing, a tremendous explosion. Black smoke started trailing from the MiG. Pieces started breaking off and the MiG was in a nose dive towards the deck. Welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here's your host, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilot, Vincent Aiello. Wait for it. What's up, everybody? I am Vincent Aiello, and that is a new intro bumper we're trying out. Thanks to my stepfather, Jim Hendershot, who has some broadcasting history. He lends his voice to the intro and outro now. We're going to try that going forward and see if we like it. Well, I hope everybody's doing pretty well. We've got an amazing interview coming up for you, as you just got a little teaser there of. And it's one of the longer interviews we've had on the show. I usually try to keep these episodes down to an hour but that's just not going to be possible with Mongo because it's such good information. So we are going to skip the listener questions for this episode. That's why we had a bonus episode a few days ago with a replay of the Facebook Live question and answer segment we had with Fitz Lee. And we just got a couple announcements and then we will jump straight into the interview with Mongo. First off, I want to share a note I received from Ian Magwick who says, in episode five on aerial refueling, you said you thought you tanked behind a British Nimrod. As an ex-Nimrod pilot, I can assure you, you didn't. Our role was maritime patrol, like a P-3, or electronic signals intelligence. RAF tankers were VC-10s or TriStars back in those days. Well, thanks for pointing that out, Ian. Yeah, you know, 20 years on my brain, that's an eternity. So, you're right, I'm wrong, and I don't mind being wrong. I thought it was a call to Nimrod, but it was probably that TriStar like you talked about. So I appreciate you clearing that up for us. And if you catch me saying something bogus, well, don't hesitate to point it out like Ian did. I would rather be factual and correct with everybody than be right, because I'm not right all the time. Anyway, the other announcement I wanted to pass along is that our merchandise store is live at last. If you go to cafepress.com slash fighter pilot podcast, all one word, you will see cool t-shirts and polo shirts, men's and women's, pullovers, hats, coffee cups, all kinds of different things, mouse pads and stickers. So if you want to wear some cool fighter pilot podcast swag, then go check it out and make an order. I will tell you there is shipping. There is tax in some places and I do get a little bit from that not a lot because they have to make these one at a time as people order that's why the prices aren't maybe rock bottom as you might hope but it's there for people who want to wear our colors and I appreciate it if you do and so check it out if you're interested and let me know what you think of the quality or any other items you might wish we would carry All right, well, like we talked about, let's jump straight into the interview because it's going to be a long one, but I know you'll enjoy it. There's a lot of new terms, a lot of deep, heady stuff, and I'll come back afterwards and try to explain a few things if we didn't explain them during the interview. All right, let's jump into it then. All right, coming to you today from just outside Dallas, Texas, the Fighter Pilot Podcast is glad to join to the show retired U.S. Navy Captain Nick Mongillo, call sign Mongo. Mongo, welcome to the show, bud. Thanks, Jello. Appreciate you and your audience bringing me into their world. Okay. Well, we're going to talk about some of your experiences in Desert Storm 1991 today. But before we do, a little tradition here on the show, we like to get to know our new guests. So please give us a quick rundown on who you are, where you've been, and what you're doing now, if you would, please. Jello, originally I'm from Connecticut. I was born in Bridgeport and grew up in Stratford, Connecticut. 1980 high school graduate. I went on to college at Western Connecticut State University, uh, graduated in 85, and it was a great time because there was a president known as Ronald Reagan back then that was conducting the defense buildup. 
So as I was winding down in college, figuring out what I wanted to do, I started a job at IBM. And at 22, I was wearing a coat and tie and not really enjoying it. That sucks. Yes. <laughs> Took the test, got accepted, and within three weeks, I was in officer candidate school. Okay. Actually, that's good because someone asked me on an early episode, can you only become a fighter pilot if you go to the Naval Academy or did I know anyone from OCS? And I did. I didn't realize you did. Okay. Sorry to hijack your story. Go ahead. No, all good. I went in on a guaranteed flying program, so went through the 14-week aviation officer candidate school in Pensacola, which has now been closed and it's been incorporated into OCS. Uh, finished up, you know, right about the time I finished up, inter- interesting side note, I had two weeks off before I started primary at Whiting Field, and I went home, and this movie premiered called Top Gun. I was on my first leave after being in the military for six, seven months and saw Top Gun and said, wow, I guess I chose correctly because I was very <laughs> excited to see that. Uh, and so then I pressed on uh, through that training command pipeline, eventually earned my wings about two years later. Okay, and tell us about your Navy career and highlights there. You went straight to the F-18, and then what? No, actually, no? I, I did fairly well. I finished in the top 10% of the class, and I was retained as, as a instructor, a oh. grad program. So I got brought right back for two years as an instructor, and at the time, I was 24, 25, I wanted to get to the fleet. Sure. In my class of individuals that were winged, all the guys I went through training with for the last year and a half, roughly, I was left behind while they all went to the fleet and started their training. It proved to be a really great tour. For the next two years I flew, I had 1,100 hours in the T2 and honed my skills. And from there I selected F-18s, and typically Sir grads got their first or second choice. And then I went to Cecil Field and arrived there in December of 1989. And finished up my training in about June of 1990. And as I finish up my training, of course, wife is pregnant for the first time, had my first house. I received orders to my first fleet squad. I'm very excited. It was VFA 81. And I walked over, popped into the ready room. I remember meeting the gang. They knew I was coming. I still was in the process of checking out from the training squadron, VFA 106. And they were getting ready to deploy within the next month. And the skipper brought me in and told me about this great summer Mediterranean cruise the squadron was going on. All the great port calls, summer med into France and Italy, and what we can expect. You got to put yourself back in that time frame. And for young listeners, they might not understand as much. We were still opposing the evil empire. The USSR were still in existence. They were starting to collapse. The Soviet Union, yeah. Yes, the Soviet Union. They were starting to collapse under economic warfare from the United States, Reagan, the defense buildup. But they were still in existence, and that was the threat we trained to. Actually, it was probably a better off world back then, except for the threat of nuclear war, because there was order in the world. There was, there was tremendous order throughout the Mideast. Uh, we don't have that order now. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Skipper told me about all the great ports. I went home. The wife wasn't happy because she was due very, very shortly. And my daughter was born about two weeks later. We are about two to three weeks from getting ready from that summer med cruise. And then as we start watching the news, Iraq massed its troops on the Kuwaiti border and invaded just a few days later. So in the process, we were told instead of deploying in early August, we may have to go early. We ended up sailing on time. Uh, But as we got on board Saratoga, all of our port cars were canceled. We loaded aboard and we sailed straight across and we were headed towards the Mideast. Uh, We were headed towards either the Persian Gulf, which Akira had not been in the Persian Gulf because of the threat there for decades, or the Red Sea. And as folks that are familiar with aviation, you fly on some of the aircraft, other folks walk on. We didn't even care qualify half the airway. Whoever flew on qualified, the rest will get you on the other side of the Atlantic off the Azores. And that's where I flew six days later off the Azores. Wow. So just go, huh? Just go. Okay. And while we were sailing across, we were in that, that mindset of we may be going right into war. Iraq, very, very formidable, coming off an eight-year war with Iran, very capable million-man military, using the top 
Soviet technology, dense integrated air defense system. Some of the top tanks, T-72s, top fighter aircraft, MiG-21s, 23s, 29s, some Mirage F-1s. Uh, they used chemical weapons in the past. And although history shows they didn't do very well, we didn't know that as a nation. We had not been at war in about 20 years. And during that time frame, we executed what's commonly referred to as a second offense in the defense industry. We're in a third offset now. The second off offset was the introduction of precision munitions, uh, GPS, and the start of development of stealth aircraft. Now, not all aircraft had precision munitions during the Gulf War. The F-18 surely did not, but the Strike Eagle did. The F-117s did. And those were somewhat kept in the dark. They were blackish programs, F-117 was. But this was the first time we were going to exercise these second offsets. And whenever you go to war, nobody knows how it's going to play out. Force on force, how will it work? Do the Soviets have capabilities and wartime modes that would negate our advantages? Would our jamming work from our jamming aircraft? Would the HARM, high-speed anti-radiation missile, really guide Nothing, this hasn't been used before, really guide and take out these integrated air defense system and radars, or would they not? Uh, so you don't really know how it's going to play out. True. Okay, so we're going to get into Desert Storm here, but can we just quickly summarize the rest of your career? So you were an F-18 guy, and then we met at Top Gun, so you did an instructor tour there. Yeah. And then tell just some highlights, if you would, of the rest of it. If yeah, yeah. Great career, and sorry, I got a little ahead of myself. <laughs> That's uh, all right. Served 28 years. Well, thank you for your and, service. And I was fortunate that out of the 28, I flew 25. Uh, I flew fighters for a little over 20, uh, over 5,000 tactical jet hours. Wow. And almost 6,000 hours. My last tour, I flew a twin-engine prop at Pacific Missile Range Facility during my commanding officer tour. Throughout the Hornet community, back and forth, so I did my fleet squad and I did an adversary tour down to Key West. I flew the F 16 N hot rod version. I flew a fours, F fives back to the Hornet training squadron department head tour in Hornets went to Germany and fought the German Megs. Nice war college, top gun command, uh, NORAD, Northcom, and then eventually Pacific Missile Range Facility. Yeah, very, very content. Then transitioned out about four years ago. The pyramid gets pretty steep, and the Navy gave me indications that, hey, we really like you, but your services might not be required any longer. <laughs> hey, well, everybody's got to fall off the pyramid at some point. You you went higher than I did, yeah, but right. to each his own, so outstanding. Roger. Okay. So... In the fall of 1990, tensions are running high. We have a coalition getting put together to try to tell Saddam Hussein and his country that what you've done is no good. And the brutality, this is one of the first wars that's really going to be shown on TV every night. You know, some of it was in Vietnam, but for the most part now we're seeing the atrocities they're committing in Kuwait. So your summer holiday cruise, if you will, gets taken away and you guys still deploy, but now it's a combat cruise. And so tell us what a squadron is like when you are getting close to, let's say, early January 1991. What is life like on the USS Saratoga? There was really nothing in place to stop the Iraqi forces from rolling into North Saudi Arabia. With that large military, we did not have a base presence here. We had a couple carriers on the scene we were flowing forces to the Mideast, but really there was nothing there to stop them. And so for the first month to six weeks, the ball was in Iraq's court, had they wanted to roll in. And they probably should have rolled in or did something else. Note to self, if you're ever going to be an evil dictator and you're going to invade, don't roll your forces in and then stop and let the enemy build up for six months. Uncontested. Uncontested <laughs> and decide when to attack you. That's right. I mean, I think we've seen that play out now twice in Iraq. I don't know if future adversary is going to play that game because it doesn't work out too well. <laughs> so we had the luxury of rolling in a Cold War military that was 30 to 50% bigger than today. 15 carrier strike groups back then, Vice 10, 11 today. And building forces for six months. So initially, defensive mindset, if they rolled into the Saudi fields, we're going to load bombs on planes and do battlefield ear interdiction and drop bombs on them along invasion routes and hope to slow them down. We'd send some Marines across, some Air Force tankers were in theater, a couple AWACS and Eagle Squadron, and that was it. But once we got into late September, October, 
We had about four carriers on the scene. We had enough forces probably as a defensive mechanism. Then we shifted gears into what will it take to offensively push them out of Kuwait. We really thought diplomacy would prevail. Saddam, at that point, we thought would be insane to want to go to blows. A lot of people will die. Why doesn't he just save face and just leave? But as we look at culturally, that's probably not something we should hold our breath on. And we started developing these plans for pushing them out. Uh, More and more troops showed up. Eventually, uh, deadline was passed by George Bush, the senior, that you need to be out by January 15. And along that way, our mindset changed from defensive mindset, what's going to happen, build up phase with plenty of gas. And all we were doing was flying and training. We flew every day, free tanker gas overhead, big wing tankers. Saudis were buying the gas. We used overland ranges back to a more serious mindset as we got into the Christmas time frame because the deadline was passed and Saddam wasn't moving out. And it looked like we were going to go to war. At that point, you really start focusing on how dense the integrated air defense system was. The most sophisticated we have seen since the Vietnam War. Top Soviet equipment, as I mentioned earlier, is how good is that going to be? Tremendous defense in depth with weapons and aircraft. Sure, they're not as good pilots trained as us, but when you have 600 combat aircraft, they can do some damage. So that was the thought going in to right around January 15. Okay. And so I assume as a squadron, you guys are doing your intelligence briefs, your Like you said, overland training. So you are actually going into Saudi Arabia and practice dropping bombs to keep your skills up. All right. So now we're probably getting to a fevered pitch, a lot like right before a big game. The deadline comes and passes. Uh, What's going on at VFA 81? Yeah. I think an interesting note is throughout the buildup phase, we rehearsed and practiced the first three days of war, uh, the offensive operations several times. We had not launched hundreds, if not thousands, of airplanes to rendezvous with 100 or 150 Air Force big wing tankers. Remember, we were coming from great distances, 500 miles one way for all the carrier-based aircraft to get into Iraq. Even some of your Saudi-based airfields were 100 miles away, so it was a big coordination effort. So we would practice throughout the fall and early winter launching tankers and practicing zigzagging the country, the flight and duration Uh, And these were called mirror image strikes, mirroring the real strikes with actually not flying into Iraqi airspace. And to your point, this is 1991. So the connectivity and Internet that we enjoy today and take for granted, frankly, didn't exist. Absolutely. We had no Internet. Internet was just a a glimmer in Al Gore's mind at the time. (laughs) And so the air tasking order, I think I once heard, used to have to be hand delivered to each carrier. And it was about as big as a yellow pages phone book, right? That's that's a great point. The air tasking order or the master schedule, as I like to call it for the whole air, the whole air battle, we sent it S3 in daily. It took off from the carrier. It landed in Riyadh. It picked up the... Next day schedule, usually at night, we got it back to the carrier. And then in the morning, we got up and executed whatever was on that day you schedule. built the schedule off of that. We that's, did. That's crazy. And they gave us, it, it was one day of hard scheduling, but it went out two or three days of what you can expect two right. or three days out. And nowadays, it's a flick of a button. That's and right. We, and we have that. Well, for better or for worse. Yes. All right. So talk to me about the morning of January 17th, 1991. Great. During those Merriman strikes, I was always going to be part of the day one strike package. The war started at night. So the war started roughly 17 January at night, and night one was the first event. Night one was when we sent in the helos to take out some early warning sites in the F-117s, and then Eagles conducted a massive mix sweep. On the heels of that was another wave of strike aircraft coming in, provided suppression of enemy air defenses, trying to beat back those defenses, paving the way for follow-on strikes. I was day one, all right? I was going in the following day around 1 o'clock. So I was planning that event while we were waiting for the execution order. I was also the schedule writer of the squadron. How convenient. Yes. So I was a schedule (laughs) writer, so I remember going to my commanding officer and operations officer, asking him, saying, well, 
the deadline's approaching. We don't have an execute order. Nobody said we're really going to war. Are we going to do a training day tomorrow? Or we, do I write a wartime schedule? What, what do I write? Are we going to go use some of the free Saudi gas? And he said, we expect the execution order, write the schedule as if we're going to war. You know, night one, day one, night two, day two. You know the schedule. You know the ordinance. You know the strike leads. And I wrote it. And sure enough, on the 16th in the afternoon, the execution order showed up. And holy cow, uh, you would think we just got, you know, a wild card birth into the, you know, the uh, Sweet 16 or something. It was <laughs> chaotic. It was exciting because you had a bunch of fighter pilots, career fighter pilots, old, young, that go their whole life. And this is the first time they get to get to actually play the game for right. real. Then the seriousness of what they were getting excited about settled in when the skipper said, oh, right letters to your loved ones just in case you don't return and oh by the way we expect losses and losses are acceptable because this is war then the realism that wow this is scary and then you start really looking hard at the threat you're going against so i wrote the schedule we continue planning at a fever space Night one launches around 11 p.m., somewhere around there. We send them off, a bunch of our pilots. Then the XO yelled at everyone, go to bed. You have to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning for your day one flight. Try going to sleep the day before you may die or the day before you're going to the big football game, whatever. Right. When the butterflies were there, tried to sleep. We heard them launch. I slept right below the flight deck, right below the four wire maybe dozed off for a couple hours and then heard the planes landing. So we woke up, got a quick shave, a quick shower. Uh, some of us put laundry out. It's pretty funny because in on the ship, you put your laundry out in a bag and they pick it up and then you, the next day it shows back up. So you put your laundry out like, that's weird. Will I be here tomorrow when it shows back up? Will I be alive to collect my laundry? Weird thoughts go through your mind, right? Sure. We head down to the ready room, and the guys that were through the mission were there talking about the mission to launch all their harm. They were launching three high-speed anti-radiation missiles each on the outskirts of Baghdad, not downtown Baghdad. That was only where the F-117s could play, but to take out some of these SAM systems. And one of our aircraft did not return. It was flown by Scott Spiker. And... They weren't sure, was Spike shot down? Did he have aircraft problems? Did he land at a Saudi divert field? And the skipper, my skipper who led that event, knew. He saw a fireball over there in a MiG-25 that was chasing Spike. Uh, so he didn't want to concern us. So he played it off like, well, I think he may have diverted. Uh, but that wasn't the case. By the time we landed, we knew that he was shot down, became the first casualty of the war. And that's a that's a whole podcast episode for you there to talk sure. about that whole thing. For sure. We had our mission. We went to the Civic. We did the main brief. Then we did element briefs, and we talked about our formation. We talked about we're going to roll in from 30,000 feet, 0.9 Mach, higher the better. What would we do if we saw bad guys? How would we defend if we are shot at by a surface-to-air missile? What is our combat search and rescue plan if we get shot down and we have to evade? And this was a massive strike that we were on. It was 30-ish planes on H-2 airfield in southwest Iraq. About 60 miles to the east of us was H-2, H-3 airfield. There's a couple of those fields, so we're going at H-3. These it's are just a, code words for the fields, correct? Yeah. It's not what the exactly. natives call them. No. It's what we call them. That's okay. what we call them. Uh, they all have names. There's H-1, H-2, H-3. They're all located in southwest Iraq. They were built by the British when the British dominated the region. Right. And then when Saddam came to power, they were a buffer in western Iraq between Lebanon and mostly Israel. If you recall, Israel attacked their nuclear facility back right. in the early 80s. So these were mega fortresses with multiple airfields, hardened bunkers, military tanks and artillery, AAA, and combat aircraft all in that area. And our objective was to go in, take out Sector Operations Center, create some runways, start to attrite some of those aircraft. The Kennedy, which also joined us in the Red Sea, was launching a concurrent strike. So within two minutes of each other, they were going to drop bombs on H-2 air field. We were on H3 airfield. They're about 60 miles apart. The idea is open up a window where everybody can come in, push the bad guys up to the north, drop your bombs and come out because it's very hard to maintain local air superiority for a very long time. So if we mass our force and go into that whole sector, we can do it. Monger, let me interrupt you if I may. Yes. <laughs> so you were a nugget on this cruise, right? Great point. Uh, so 
was it not the case that day one was going to be all the salty guys who had a bunch of experience? I mean, now you were an experienced instructor as a sir grad, as you called it, but was were there other first crews, JOs going out on these strikes? It's a great point. Everybody had a play. When you look at a F-18 squad or a single seat that we had, mm-hmm. we had 10, 10 jets, we had 17 pilots, and you look, they were launching six planes at night one, six planes day one. You quickly see that you can't turn those pilots around in time and rest them. And, oh, by the way, we were also manning combat air patrol stations in the Red Sea in case Iraq tried to sneak an F-1 down along the coast and launch exercises at our carrier strike group. You will quickly burn out your crews. So if you're doing a punitive one-time strike off a carrier, many times you will load up your A-team and send them in because you can't. And you want your best. But when you were in prolonged campaign, everybody has to play and your junior officers have to step up and fill in. They probably won't be put in a lead role, but they'll be a wingman. Sure. And let me ask you one other thing. And I don't think my listeners are sensitive to this, but I am. So I'll, I'll just mention it. I hope you would agree with me that most fighter pilots are not warmongers. I don't go out when I used to go out to bars and look for a fight. I'm not looking for a conflict. Yeah. But by God, if there is going to be a conflict, then I want to be a part of it. And I think you touched on that before. In other words, and I use an analogy I like to use, which is, look, we practice for this game all the time. If a game is going to be played, well, put me in, coach. Was yeah. that basically true for you? I, I would agree 100%. And uh, war is horrible. Uh, m- m- military members typically don't start wars. Politicians do. War is nothing more than politics by other means. If Saddam had just left, don't invade or just leave, that's politics, right? Get out of the country, he leaves, fight. War is just another tool when people don't want to listen. Uh, it's throughout history. Uh, that's what they use. That's a World War I. Give me your country. Give me your rich lands. No. Okay, then I'm going to take them. That's war. And your military, at least in your peaceful military nations like us, we'd rather just play fighter pilot in the warning area and training areas and practice dropping dummy bombs and train for war than actually go into war. Cause it's sort of cool for a while. And there's probably a small percentage that really love that. But once people are really shooting at you with real bullets and your friends die, you quickly realize war uh, is not glorious and war is not good. And man is very, very destructive. That said, there is evil in this world. And there needs to be people under arms. There needs to be people that will protect our nation, that will go out and protect weaker nations. And until we can eliminate the evil in the world, and we see it flourishing throughout the world right now, you're always going to have this tension. You you may delete this. Man, (laughs) Man, especially in your very rich and spoiled nations like the United States, they get sort of insulated to the cruelties and the evils of what's going on in the world, especially in some of your less prosperous uh, worlds where war, protection, gathering resources is very, very vital to their existence. We don't have that here. You want to see it? Go ahead and shut the water off, shut the electricity off, Mm -hmm. slow down the the superfood stores, and take the police away, oh, by the way. Right. And you'll quickly see how America would form its own clans. And you would bond with your neighbors and your family, and the guns would come out of the safe, and you would hoard your food and protect it and protect your children. And when you ran out, you would take from the people next door. Now, that's very cruel and mean. That's the reality of who we are as a species and as a people. Yep, very true. Okay, so on January 17th, like you said, strikes had started first thing in the morning, what, like 3 a.m. local time. And yes. so you are on day one, as we're calling it, and you are a wingman to a strike to an airfield? We are, we have actually a MIG sweep out in front of us. Okay. Uh, OCA, they call Offensive Combat Air. Now, we had about 30 aircraft total supporting us. Our idea was to head in straight towards the airfield complex and drop our bombs. Mark 84, 2,000 pounders, free fall bombs. Dumb bombs, but you can get a dumb bomb within 50 to 100 feet uh, if you're worth your salt in a F-18 or an F-16 visually bomb. And they're pretty accurate. Precision's better, but dumb bombs can do very, very well. We had about 40 miles out in front of us a four-ship of Tomcats sweeping the, the target area in a clockwise flow. 
hopefully pushing out any MIGs or attriting them before they came in. Also supporting us were aircraft to the west of the airfield launching TOD, tactical air launch decoys. They would launch them about 30, 40 miles away, and they fly a 0.8, 0.9 profile in. They have a radar cross-section that stimulates the enemy IADs and in the hope that they vector enemy fighters or they shoot enemy surface-to-air missiles at the TOD because there's nobody in them and they're low cost. We also had aircraft launch in Walleye, which were a TV-guided bomb that were developed primarily at the end of the Vietnam era. We had to the south of us, outside about 34 miles, dual axis jamming and aircraft launch in multiple high-speed anti-radiation missiles. The idea with the HARM is we will launch them and form an umbrella with the HARM coming overhead the target area, opening its seeker about every 30 to 45 seconds. And if a SA-6 or an SA-2 or SA-3 opens up, it will home in and guide and kill that radar site. I was part of the strike package. They actually, the bombers flying in directly into the threat defensive system, dropping dumb bombs, roll in at 30,000 feet and try to have a minimum altitude of 15 to 20,000 feet. The threat order of battle I mentioned earlier consists of the full gamut of MiG aircraft into the city. At that target area, they did have SAM systems. They had six confirmed SA-6 sites, all sorts of AAA that can reach up to 30,000 feet and touch us. So that was basically our plan and our tactic going into that. Okay. But you were in the F-A-18, so we've had Willie Driscoll on this show talk about in the Vietnam conflict, the F-4 would be equipped with both bombs and missiles, yes. but it was just the F-4. So you guys are in the debut of the F-A-18. So even though you've got the F-14s out there, you've got sparrows, sidewinders, and 2,000-pound bombs and gun bullets. Yes, great point. We carry two 500-pound uh, AIM-7 mics and... Two nine mic also and four bombs. Some of us had jammer pod two on board. I had one. It didn't work that well. But we did have the ability. This is a great point. And this was the the dawn or the birth of that true strike fighter, much more capable with a modern APG sixty five uh, sixty five radar. Where with one push of a button in about a second, it can change from an ear to ground to an ear to ear mode. And I could I can be doing that. I don't think we are really utilizing it that well in 1990 in that dual mode. For instance, as we're driving into the target, we were briefed to go ahead and select the ear-to-ground mode about 35 miles south of the target. So at that point, the radar is no longer scanning the airspace out in front of you. It's now changes the, the wave format, and it's focused at the ground, and it's looking to do some ground mapping type functionality. You can't see bad guys. Why did we do that? Well, we had a heavy A7 influence in the community at the time. The A7 community was, they didn't do ear to ear. They wanted to make sure all your switches are set, get your bombs off on target. We didn't need to worry about ear to ear. We had Tomcats out in front of us. We saw that change during the Gulf War and then throughout my career flying F-18s. With iron bombs in that situation, we would not, in today's tactics, probably select ear to ground until just before rolling. There's no reason to with those weapons. Right. You want to keep your eyes open. But you can understand the A-7's point of view. If that was their only mission, you don't want to get to the point where it's showtime and, oops, my fly is down, right? I left the master arm off or I left this switch in the wrong position. Without a doubt. So, okay. Without, I understand the mindset and we had great folks, great leaders, great bombers. The point is the culture and tactics really evolved over my career. And that's another whole podcast sure. of how we morphed the Top Gun Pro and the training program. Uh, one quick flash forward. I was a Super Hornet CO in 2005. Had I been in that Super Hornet with the training I had, or when you and I were on Top Gun staff in 2000, we would have been on my same mission, probably had three kills each. There were so many bad guys airborne that I'll talk about shortly. We would have rolled in and mowed it down. We'd have better systems, better training, understood the airspace better. But back then in 1990, we were still better than the enemy, but not quite as capable as we could have been because we only been flying that airplane and understanding its capabilities at the fleet level for about two or three years. Well, and it's easy to look back and say, well, why it didn't is. we know what we know now? So It, it is. All yeah, right. good, great point. Okay. Well, what I want to do here, Mongo, is I want to play the audio recording of the strike, and not the entire strike, because it lasted probably several hours by the time you got fuel and everything else, but we'll take the critical few moments where we have someone who's making some calls, and then we're going to hear some different voices. And so I want to set up the audio before we play it. Then I want to play the whole 
audio. They don't want to come back and take little bits and have you explain it, if you would, sure. for the listener. But before we do that, let's talk about some terminology. So first off, can you explain very briefly the difference between, and you never hear the word hostile in this recording, but it's something you and I have used hundreds of times since. But tell me the difference between a bogey, a bandit, and a hostile, please. Great. Well, hostile didn't exist back then, that word. Oh, it didn't? That was oh, not in that. the also. Uh, there are standardized comm terms, this is for your audience, that in the past, the Navy had theirs, and the Air Force had theirs, and there's an also conference. They have come together much better in the last decade or two to standardize the terminology in phrases that we use in all controlling aircraft and a fighter aircraft. So back in 1990, you had bogey, which was an unknown. That means a contact out there that I can't identify. Air contact. Air contact that you probably see on a radar blip. Because if you see him with your eyeballs, you can determine if he's a good or bad guy most of the time, right? Uh, that you're not sure if he's good or bad. So he's a bogey. He's an unknown. If he's a friend, he's called a friend. And if he is a confirmed bad guy back in 1990, he is called a bandit. Okay. So in today's terminology, a bandit is, okay, I know this is an enemy. But that doesn't necessarily mean I'm allowed to engage him. Exactly. And now if he is allowed to be engaged, then he's a hostile. Exactly. For instance, that came in when we started doing uh, Southern Watch. We had no-fly zones. We couldn't shoot down bad guys behind the no-fly zone when they were on the Iraqi side of it, right? But we want to know he was there. So we would refer to him as a bandit. means, hey, there's a bad guy flying around back there. When he crosses that line and now he's going south of it, he turns into a hostile. I mean, hey, all fear game, go out and kill him. Okay. And the other thing I want to set up is that we have a bunch of different voices on the recording. So when we first hear them, if you could just tell us who they are. But in general, you have, I think, were you guys under E2 control that day or AWACS control? E2. E2. Okay. So we'll have a voice of that. Then we'll hear the word Manny. Now, is that your reference point? Yes. Manny was the geographic bullseye that we use for the strike. Uh, for the, It's a point in the ground that if we reference that point, north, south, east, west, uh, compass heading and range, we all have situation where as to where the bad guy is. We didn't train to it back in 1990. We used tactical control, bearing range azimuth from our own fighter aircraft. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a detriment. Our systems were not made to move our cursors on our screen to really understand those manis. It, it turned into very confusing. Now, the Air Force was ahead of us back then, and they typically used this broadcast bullseye control quite well. They wrote the ATO, so it was really hard for us to get up to speed again. After the Gulf War, we got much better. It was incorporated into our systems, and that was located about 15 nautical miles northwest of our target area, Manny okay. was. So Manny, in this case, was the name of a common reference point that we all know where it is. And from it, if a bandit is 27015, well, then we know it's west 15 miles. And then it could either be hot on us, which means it's heading towards us, or it could be flowing north or south or east or west. And then, of course, we have altitudes, et cetera. Okay. And then is there another voice on this that we'll hear in a moment? Is there someone else that's kind of monitoring, like almost the voice of God who says, hey, you, you better listen up because that guy's right on your nose? There is. We had our primary E2 controller. There was also a couple controllers on there, and they got into the plain language of a 400. That's our side number for Maggot. You'll hear it. Yeah. You have a bad guy in your nose. So you're not listening to my broadcast, Manny Call. Well, that's right. You guys don't train it anyway, but I know how to use it. You don't. But you're not hearing that. So let me, let me call your side number. You're about ready to, like, die if you don't get your act together. And so that clued us in to come out of that ear-to-ground mode all right, and go into ear-to-ear -ear mode and sanitize out in front of us. Okay. And then one more thing. Were you guys, how many was in your particular element? We were in a four ship. And uh, what formation were you in? By the time this occurred, we were almost in a wallish formation. Going into the target area, Maggot McGee, the XO, was the lead. I was his wingman. I was dash two. Mm -hmm. And then Chuck Bonser Osborne was three. He was second section lead. Mark Fox, who retired as a three-star, was dash four. Uh, we initially went in a closer formation, a box, and as we got approaching the target, 35, since their target was to the east of ours, we were almost in a wall formation. So from west to east, it was me, then Maggot, then Bouncer, then Mark Fox. 
I was closing in on attack wing for position and echelon formation off a of maggot at the time because we were going to roll in about a quarter of a mile apart, and the other two were about a mile apart. Okay. All right. Well, let's play the tape, and then we will come back and Great. listen to bits of it. New picture, abandoned, 190, 20 mini. Take not spread. Fight wing. Get out of my way. Okay, wow. I personally have listened to that probably dozens of times. I have to think you've obviously lived it, but probably in the last almost, gosh, over 30 years. No, not quite 30 years. Listen to that, what, hundreds, thousands? Hundreds. Hundreds hundreds, At least hundreds. uh, Many, many times I've given presentations with it. Okay. All right. Well, so what I want to do now is I want to play a snippet of it, and I'd like you to explain for the listener who didn't lead the lives that we led uh, what it sounds like, and, and maybe even some, if you want, what we could have done better. I know there will be people talking over each other, or there sure. were, I should say. So let's hear it, and then let's uh, talk about what's being said and maybe okay. how it could have been better. All right. New picture, abandoned, 190, 20 mini. Take not spread, fight away, get out of my way. All right, so what do we got there? Bandit Manny uh, 19020. So there's a, a bandit heading south from Manny. Remember, Manny is about 15, 20 miles northwest of our target airfield, and we're headed to the target airfield. So we're about 35, 40 ish, maybe 50 miles south. All makes sense today, especially after 20 years of working bullseye control. Right. Uh, back then, what we don't hear on the tape that you don't have is 50 minutes of call after call for call with multiple bandit and bogey groups airborne. There were, there were six confirmed groups airborne that day in that sector, fading in, fading out with radar. Uh, some were bandits. They knew some were bogeys. And at some point the brain just starts filtering information, shutting it down, focusing on the task at hand, which was don't lose sight of maggot. Cause he yelled at me. If I lost sight, make sure your switches are set. We're going to get our bombs off on target. Stick to the basics. Uh, all of us in that four ship, even Maggot and Mert and Bouncer, who are all very seasoned folks with thousands of hours, started filtering that information. Yeah, I mean, it's clear that here we are later listening to it. But in fact, while this call is coming on that we know is kind of the beginning of yes. game time, your lead is basically yelling at you to get in the right formation. Yes, he missed it, and Maggot was very good aviator. He had probably the same amount of time or less time than me in Hornet. He basically was flying A-7 six months prior, just like everybody else. Uh, and what we see with technology, younger people adapt faster. You probably see it nowadays. So 
you know, my generation showing up in a fourth gen aircraft with new radar, new displays, that was cool. You know, we could do it much quicker. And they looked at us with all going, wow, you guys pick it up so much faster. Many of us were starting to pass in that six month period the ability, the pure raw radar ability and systems ability to pass some of our leaders, maybe not landing and taking off, but new things, just like we see with today's generation with picking up and they're better eye folks at work that are passing me quickly with technology. Like, how do they do that? They're much more agile. Yeah. No, I see that at home with my three sons. Okay. Let's uh, listen to the next clip. All right, so we got some tones there. What are those? Those are raw gear, RWR, radar warning receiver tones. It's very interesting. I was in aircraft 410 that day. Aircraft 410 had some faulty RWR receiver or probes or sensors, and we they were in the process of trying to troubleshoot that, but they weren't going to keep the jet on deck because we had problems. So that is doing what's called self-spiking. My radar is actually setting off my own raw gear. So we have a radar that emits radar energy, duh. And then we have radar warning receiver that tries to detect someone else's, and your receiver is detecting your transmission. Yes. There are filters okay. built in typically that operate. Ours wasn't working good, and we were not that good at servicing this type of gear back in the early 90s. We didn't have the right test equipment and training. We got better. Yeah. It's almost go, no go these days. It is. All right. Let's listen to the next one. Minute, Minute, 185, 25, southbound. Okay, what do we got there? They're getting closer, and we don't have situation awareness that that's happening. And whose voice is that? That is the E2 controller. Okay. And he's just broadcasting this to anybody. Yeah. And so it's not really clear. Again, by today's standards, we have a usually, hey, you, this is me. Here's what you need to know. We've got a, a template for our communication calls. But back then, he's just kind of throwing this out to anyone. It was. Who, that's okay. uh, broadcast control. And that's John Joyce. He was the E2 lieutenant. Okay. Okay, so then somebody comes up and says, hey, 400. That bandit's on your nose, 15. Now, 400 is the side number. Usually at the carrier, we use that for LSOs and landings and whatnot. Did you guys not have a tactical call sign that day? Uh, we did. We were, uh, I believe, granite flight, but we were not as disciplined with call sign uses. ATO had call signs. Uh, we had our ship call signs. Mm. We had our strike group call signs. We had personal call signs. Right. Over the next 10 or 15 years, we became much better at using standardized ATO call signs. But it was culturally, it was a little different. And we reverted back to side numbers. You typically don't do that. That was the same controller, John Joyce, going to tactical control, bra control for 400, saying 400, bandits on your nose, 15. Like, hey, dummy, wake up. Wake up. (laughs) Interesting is that uh, he used the word bandit. And so that's part of identification. That means he's a bad guy. He's on your nose at 15. If you can correlate that position, you are cleared to engage that target beyond visual range. Wow. And I'll get there because it's going to come up later is Maggot wasn't sure if he said bandit or bogey. And that's the reason why Maggot does not end up firing in this, but continues with a VID, a visual identification of the aircraft as they stream towards us. Okay. Because we don't want to just shoot at bogeys because it could just as easily be a friendly. Uh, You were talking about Spiker earlier. If he had his information gear shot out, we might not know who he is and we don't want to just shoot at somebody. A blue on blue is when a friendly force shoots out another friendly is probably the worst thing that can happen to you. You remember in training. Oh, yeah. And... Maggot and the whole leadership team on Saratoga drilled in our head, do not be trigger happy. There were thousands of coalition aircraft and sorties in country that day. Don't be trying to make yourself a hero. So you were you were geared to not shoot unless you really, really knew. Okay. The other thing Maggot said was, if you shoot down a good guy, you might as well roll inverted and eject in country because you're going to hate yourself for the rest of your life. <laughs> A, a little dramatic, but that's probably ma- so. I mean, that's that would ma- be... That's maggot. That would be tough to get past. Yeah. All right, let's play the next one. 200 radar contact on my nose. Mark at 28,000. Now, it sounds like he says 200. Did he... Or is it just the recording? Yeah, I believe 400 okay. radar contact on it. It was Mach at 28,000. 
So in other words, hey, now I'm picking this guy up. And in fact, you hear just a little bit of that AIM-9 tone start. So in other words, you guys were in air to ground, but now this is your aircraft we're listening to. You've rocked back to air to air. Yes. Okay. Yes. So I heard the call. It took me a few potatoes, if you're listening, because I was in disbelief. I was in air ground. I hear four. I hear the call of 400 bands saying your nose at 15. I'm like, did they just say there's bad guys on a nose of 15 <laughs> and I'm in air to ground? Now, how did that, you know, just that thought process was six or seven seconds. And by the time, Brad, I'm thinking about hitting the button to go to ear to ear. Maggot comes up with the bra, 400 band of saying nose. Uh, and at that point, yes, I do. I, I select ear to ear, nine mic, and then I look at the range. Well, it's out past the range of the AIM-9, I'd probably be better off in a longer-range missile, so I selected the Sparrow missile. And that's why the tone will go away initially. Okay. 170-35. Okay, so it sounds like he says MiG-21 there at the end. What, what What's that about? Exactly. So without getting into all the classified details... Aircraft, even back 1990, and more so today, have the ability beyond visual range to identify what that threat is or what an aircraft is. And they could use it by electronic means, and there's some other methodologies that I won't go into here. Against a MiG-21, an older system that's been in the library for a long time, there was a high confidence level. There are some newer planes that weren't in the library, but that was not part of our rules of engagement. We could not use that as an ability to... to determine if it was a good or bad guy. We had to use the call and correlation from the E-2 that that is the bad contact that we're going to shoot at. It helps. It gave us a warm fuzzy in our stomach. And Mag was telling me, hey, I got a pretty good idea. This is a bad guy. Uh, but he did not shoot because he heard bogey from the E-2. Incorrectly. Incorrectly, but, yes. But to your point, so you've got these calls earlier on that, hey, you guys, here's this bandit off of Manny. And then, hey, 400, this guy's on your nose. And so now it's up to you to say, okay, I know of these, maybe there's more than one, but I know that of these different contacts I see on my radar, this one is an enemy. And again, you're prone to not shoot unless you're absolutely certain, just based on the number of friendlies that are airborne that day. Yes. And Maggot took a very conservative route. History will show that Mark Fox heard Bandit like I did. Mark Fox was shooting at five or six miles. I, being a more junior aviator and didn't want to have the wrath of Maggot, waited. I was within weapons launch zones. I had the trail MIG of two MIGs locked up. I hear Maggot calling for VID, and I'm thinking, why is he calling for VID? He says MIG-21. They were called bandits. He should be shooting, but he's not. He's calling for VID, so... Let me think about this for a couple seconds. Uh, I got to the point where I couldn't take it anymore. We'll, I'm sure we'll get to that point in the tape. Okay, and a VID is a visual identification. In other words, if I don't know who somebody is, I may pass close aboard so I can take a quick glance as he goes racing by and say, oh, that is a bandit or it's a friendly or it's a whatever. Exactly. And the, the idea is when you're making that identification – you don't have enough time to see him and then shoot him typically because right. of the min range of the missiles and even with a gun. So the wingmen or supporting will be a mile or two mile in trail of the eyeball, as we call them, the mm -hmm. identifier. And he will visually say, hey, good guy or bad guy on the radio. And you have, as a wingman, probably a second or two to get a shot off before you also are at minimum range for your weapon. Right. Okay. But in this case... He is thinking this incorrectly. You're thinking this is an enemy. Yes. And so let's play the next part. Right, yeah, okay, so that is the lead calling for VID, and you're saying you're locked, meaning your radar has this guy picked up. Exactly. Locked means I don't know how many aircraft are in that threat group. But I have one of them. I have one of them. If I had called sorted or if I had a chance to look at that group and pick out which one I wanted, I would have called sorted or something along those lines. Okay. Well, section, stand by for BID. Coming down my note, both side, Mark. So it sounds like he's saying trail section, stand by for VID. That's why I asked you earlier what formation you were in, and you just talked about the VID. Was there someone right behind you guys? No. Uh, what? I don't know if Maggie knew they were lined out abreast, and they weren't. 
Maggot had called me into fighter wing position from our spread, and I started collapsing right about the time that the call started coming in. At that point, I started taking a cut away from him again, and I trying to get separation. So he wasn't aware of He wasn't looking. He would have probably yelled at me, but I was starting to drift back to about a mile off of him in case we had to execute a visual identification. Okay. But someone seems to acknowledge that call right at the very end. Yeah, it might have been the other section. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure. All right. Good sniff, Mick 21. Okay, so now it sounds like we're getting in the short hairs. We have two different voices. We have you calling... What are you calling there? I called that I had the contact. Uh, I said good sniff, MiG-21. Um, sniff is a uh, is a wrong com brevity term, but it's saying that my system is also showing that it's a MiG-21. Okay. Uh, and uh, although not part of the positive identification matrix and rules of engagement, it also gave me a warm fuzzy that I heard Bandit they're on my nose, and that my system's telling me they're bad guys. And then I think I hear the word kill in that one. Has someone, has Mert already f- fired his missiles at this point? Yeah, Mert shot. Uh, there were actually two MiG-21s, international information, about a mile there, 28,000 feet at 1.2 Mach. We are at about 30,000 to 31,000 at about a 0.9 Mach. Mark Fox didn't say anything on the radio, but he switched to ear to ear, locked, in around seven, eight miles, he took a six-mile sidewinder shot, which is sort of the max range of it. Wasn't sure that missile was going to get there. Then he selected Spiro and shot the Spiro. Both of his missiles end up impacting the lead MiG about eight seconds before my missile impacted the trail MiG. Maggot, God bless his soul, took both MiGs, one down each side of his airplane. He split the section and had a fireball down each side of his airplane. <laughs> Oh, dear me. All right, let's play the next part. Fox 1, MiG-21 low. Fox 1, whenever you pull the trigger, uh, you typically say what kind of missile you're, you're pulling a trigger on. So Fox 1 is an AIM-7. Fox 2 is a heat seeker. Fox 3 is an AMRAM for today's vernacular. And a descriptor, Fox 1 trailer, Fox 1 leader. Fox 1, MiG-21, he was low. We were at 30,000. He was at 20, so he was a little bit low. A descriptor maybe not required. The shot occurred at about 2.6 miles, right at the minimum range for AIM-7 Sparrow for that type of closure. Uh, It was so close, in fact, that as soon as I pulled the trigger, I had the X on my heads-up display, which says, don't shoot, you're now inside minimum range. But I had pulled the trigger about a second before that X appeared on the HUD. So you knew about valid shot stuff even back then. We talked about that with Grant in Episode 7, how in training it's important because you want to give your missile the best chance. So, I mean, whether you knew it or not, you ended up giving that missile the chance to get there. And, in fact, it did. We, we did. We understood valid shot. I had a shoot cue. Mm-hmm. And I knew that I was going to be shortly inside of min range for that weapon. So as the gears were turning as I'm driving down range, remember I had the lock at about seven miles. I had the sniff at 4.5 miles. I said, I only have a couple potatoes to make a decision. Maggot says VID. I think he's wrong. I can't take it anymore. I'm taking a shot. So Mick 21. Oh, that's good. So at this point, you're in the visual arena. I mean, you squeeze the thing at a couple miles. You guys are closing on each other at probably 1,200 miles an hour. So now we're in the visual arena. Without a doubt. And I could see the spec row. The missile, it's a big missile, 500-pound missile. It takes about a second to leave the airplane. I never shot a missile before. You assume it's instantaneous from TV shows, right? But it's a big clunk off the right wing. The wing off the right fuselage stations, the right side drops just a little bit, and the missile flies out in front, burning, and it starts pulling to the right. And I'm thinking, why are you going to the right? The bandit's on my nose, but the missile's smart. It's pulling lead, right? Because it wants to hit a space and time to intercept that Mach 1.2 missile. I continue turning towards the MiG to keep it locked up with my radar because my radar is guiding my semi-active missile. And the missile ends up impacting the MiG at, 0.5 0.5 to 0.6, a half mile away from me. I could see it was a tan and brown MiG-21. The missile impacted after the wing, a tremendous explosion. Black smoke started trailing from the MiG. Pieces started breaking off, and the MiG was in a nosedive towards the deck. All this happened in just a few seconds because I only had it in sight for a couple potatoes. 
I called the shot and I call the hit and the kill and bouncers on the other formation also rogering up that uh, there was a kill on that side of the formation, but some of that calm is stepped on. All right, splash one, what does that mean? A splash is the brevity term for when you shoot down uh, an aircraft. And I shot one missile, I'm like, splash one. I had no idea on the other side of the formation that Mark Fox had shot the lead. It sort of stepped on, but you'll hear the comm, bouncer Osborne, who wasn't sure if their bandits bogeys never shot, confirmed two kills. He splashed two. Gotcha. And then what is the growling tone we're hearing there? You had shot a sparrow. What, yes. are, what are you doing now with your system? Typically what you do when you employ weapons is you start in the furthest range weapon under the hammer. And then as that minimum range approaches, you step to your next weapon. So Sparrow missile was a longer range. And then as you step inside the mid-range, so remember I said right at 2.5 miles is where I took my shot. That was mid-range. I stepped to 9 mic. I had the ability for a few seconds maybe to launch a 9 mic. And then I stepped to gun as he closed inside of that range. And that's just the training that we impart on our young folks. And we still do that today. Too close for missiles, switching to guns? There it is. You said it. <laughs> All right, I owe some money. Sorry, Grand. Okay, let's uh, let's listen to the rest of this, and we'll wrap it up. So at the end of this whole thing, it's almost like business as usual. Like, okay, we're done with that. What's next? It was interesting. We downed the MiGs about 30 miles south of the target. Never expected to see them, as I outlined earlier. The learning curve, though, is pretty steep in combat. We didn't go back to ear-to-ground mode like we were in. <laughs> we stayed in ear-to-ear, -ear, and shortly after clearing the merge with those lead section of MiG-21s that we splashed, we had radar contacts on additional bogeys, unknowns, that were coming towards us. They were at mid-20s, 24, 25,000 feet between 0.4 and 0.6 Mach. Why so slow? Were they friendlies? Were they off course? We continued driving in, and I drove in to five nautical miles of, and I'm locked on one of those. Uh, I had a shoot cue. He's definitely within my weapons range. I could add another kill. We only asked the E2 one time who they were, and it was so much calm going on, the E2 didn't hear us. And we basically something along the lines of strikers are locked up on bogeys over to target 24,000 feet, point four. Should have said status, et cetera. Never got a reply. Uh, at about five miles, they turned towards the north. I remember we were attacking from the south, and they start running away and diving for the deck. And we were with a dilemma. Do we jettison our bombs and pursue? Are they trying to pull into a sand bush, you know, into a missile zone? We look down. We're over the target. At that point, we're there to drop bombs. We still had our bombs. We selected ear to ground, rolled in, and dropped our bombs, destroying the target. The sector operations center, Mark Fock put his bombs through the hangar. We blew up the POL facility. You could see the smoke for miles and miles away. As I came off target, I went back to ear to ear. I took a quick peek to the north where they were in case they had turned around, didn't see them, and then we egressed to the south, uh, got on the tanker, and then we had our hour and a half flight back home uh, to the Red Sea. So a SAM bush is like an ambush, but with surface-to-air missiles. In other words, they try to lure you in and then shoot you. And then POL, I think, is what? Petroleum oil lubricant. Lubricant, yes. Yeah. So I spend a lot of time on the show explaining no, that. No, that's good. I try to fill in the acronyms, but that okay. was it. What was it like for the hour and a half sitting in the airplane knowing that you had just gotten an air-to-air -air kill for the first time in 20 years in the Navy? Well, maybe not. I guess we had some Libyan kills. But, I mean, not everybody gets this opportunity. I was excited to be alive. Uh, honestly, I did not expect all of us to survive that mission. We lost Spike Night 1. We are going in to the belly of the beast, the Strikers. Maggot didn't say, he told me after, he thought we were going to lose half the Strikers going that were going to the target. We had we're supposed to have a six ship. Only four end up making it to the target. A couple fell out for whatever reason, aircraft problems or... But not because of enemy action. No. They had aircraft problems and okay. the spear plan or I don't know, but... I was going there. I I'd signed up. My knees were shaking all the way into the target. I couldn't eat any breakfast. It was like somebody, I had a knot in my stomach. And I just told myself, I said, this is it. I signed up to do this. I may die, but I am doing what I signed up to do. And that's just part of the deal. 
So I was very happy to see those alive. And a kill was on top of that, just glorious. And of course, I didn't realize all that it would bring the notoriety, the fame, uh, some people that just don't like you because you had it. Envy. The implied arrogance. Uh, you know, I got a silver star. I mean, there's a lot of good and bad, almost all good, believe me. I'll take right. some of the bad with it. Uh, but it was definitely a great opportunity. Uh, I've been invited, and I'm still, after being on staff, we can always go back to Top Gun, but I go back about every two or three years, and I talk about the kill. And I've modernized it. I bring in fifth-generation story into it. It's still relevant in understanding the history of where we are today uh, in warfare and why fifth gen is important. So it's still a relevant story. It sure. still plays. You know, there used to be stories from Vietnam that the hardest part for those guys doing the A6, let's say, attacks was landing on the ship. So this might sound a little odd, but do you recall your landing that day back on the ship? I remember it being relatively uneventful most of them we were in the red sea the red sea was pretty flat mm -hmm. uh, it was great weather almost the entire time and the sun was up so that's a plus it, it was uh, we also i had a lot of night missions the one thing i would say is <laughs> the tack in was never on so you could never find a damn ship it was off the whole cruise so <laughs> you, you didn't could, want to find the wrong this. ship right yeah uh, we actually had a7s from kennedy land on our ship that's another whole side story oh yeah they were not happy when they landed and we covered them with stickers from every squadron <laughs> on saratoga uh, yeah. But the landings weren't bad. Uh, fortunately for me, landings were never what I would say just casual and easy. But no, I, yeah, I, I never just met that one no, while you were still keyed it was, up. It was, it was fine. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to get aboard, and it sure. was fine. Mongo, in his book, Fox 2, Randy Cunningham talks about the night on the ship when they were celebrating his first kill. And someone, I don't think it was the chaplain, but I, I think he went and talked to the chaplain later. Someone asked him... And I didn't tell you I was going to ask this, so if you want to yeah. punt, that's fine. But someone asked him what it was like to take a life. And it hit him pretty hard. And so I'm wondering if you're willing to share with a listener, I'm sure you have come to terms with that. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are. Yeah. First uh, off, do you know the disposition of the pilot? No, I don't. I don't think he survived. Uh, the war hit on a sparrow is very big and a blast frag and where it hit. I, I hope he did, honestly. Uh I sort of talked about it earlier. War is wasteful. Yeah, you know, I wish we never had to go to war. Uh, don't like taking a life. It was, you know, it's kill or be killed. Politicians put you in a situation where you have to take a life. And I think we can be more civilized. I don't think we're going to do it in our lifetime, but I like to think we can be more civilized. Young men, typically now young women go to war and they die and they get maimed because old farts, typically men, wage war for whatever reasons. Uh, God will judge me. Uh, hopefully it, it's hard. I, I drop bombs on buildings and facilities here as part of the war and, uh, war is just horrible, horrible thing that, uh, you know, I'm proud of my service and what I did, but I don't like war. Uh, I don't like the aspects of taking lives. Hey, I'm with you. And yeah. I hope people will appreciate the humility because look, like you said, we sign up to do this. We may very well have to sacrifice our own lives, which is part of the job. And part of the job is that I may have to take someone else's life and I'm not going to revel in it. I'm not going to brag about it. And it's just one of these tensions of humanity. And like you said, it's too bad the people who are starting it don't go do it because the rest of us have to do it instead. And I I'm sure People have struggled with this as long as there's been warfare. They have to. Uh, when we have the insulation, in my mind, of elite class of many nations, our nations included, a very small percentage actually send their children to war and face the horrors of war. We forget how bad war is. Uh, World War One, with millions killed, everybody felt that effort, especially in the European nations. Uh, although they didn't learn, they did it again tw 20 years later in World War II, but there were sacrifices. Even our nation in World War II sacrificed. The, the fate of the world was at hand. We didn't want to speak German or Japanese. Everybody mobilized and was ready and realized the sacrifice. And we really haven't been threatened as a nation, and that's good since World War II. We survived the Cold War, and there's really not a threat now 
of us having to worry about that. But by having a volunteer force, a very small percentage that serve fighting war for 25 years, separated from the elitists that run this country, I don't think is in a long term best interest. Yeah, it's an interesting, unprecedented era we live in today. And I would argue that while we, I hope, if I may speak for most Westerners and especially American military, we still have some reverence for taking lives, but it certainly doesn't seem like it's reciprocated by those who would like to wage war against us, whether it's conventional or unconventional. Yes. So there, again, is probably a whole different discussion, but I, I appreciate your vulnerability on that, and I know you've had to deal with it, but on the other hand, you saw your friends also get killed, so it kind of comes with the territory. I mean, do you say Spike was from your ship? Spike was squadron mate. Oh, he and was in your squadron? Spike was our spot, squadron mate. He was oh, one gosh. of our department heads. He that. was very good to junior officers. Um, he is one of the first guys I met when I walked into the squadron, and uh, you always hear those accolades, great guy. He truly was. Yeah. He reached out to junior officers. Sometimes there's a divide between the middle-level management department heads and the JOs, and Spike had been a... F-18 training squad and instructor. So he understood that relationship and struggles, whether it's initially behind the boat or tactics. So that was a great loss. And we end up losing on night two, two A-6s got shot down. One limped into Saudi. The other one had two POWs for the rest of the war. Jeff Zahn, who was on the cover of Time magazine. A couple nights later, we lost a Tomcat, another POW and one that was patriated who was rescued at dawn with A-10 strafing the Iraqis as uh, they were looking to catch him. You need to get him, Devin Jones, on your show for a podcast. For sure. His story with Rat Slade of how they were shot down, how Rat became a POW and Devin Jones evaded and the A-10 showed up at daylight and saved him is a whole two-hour episode that was just riveting when he tells that story. Oh, I'm sure. Was Jeffrey Zahn's pilot smiling Bob? Does that sound right? Wetzel, um, something like that? I don't re Smiles might have been his call sign. I don't, re I don't remember. I think it was Bob Wetzel. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Bob he Wetzel. Was, so he was an A-4 instructor when I went through VT-7 a couple of years later. Really? And I'll never forget this. It's February 14th, 1995, probably. And he's telling the story of ingressing at 50 feet yes. in the dark over Iraq. And we are students, of course. We're just hungry eating this up. We're on the edge of our seats in this auditorium. It's actually the um, big conference room for the squadron. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the door bursts open, and all the spouses come in in red dresses with balloons and flowers because it's Valentine's Day. Wow. And talk about the biggest you know, dichotomy between what you're thinking and doing and what someone well-natured is trying to do, well-intentioned, yeah. I should say. It was so weird because you're in this frame, you're with him, you're at 50 feet, you know, the jet just breaks apart, you're pulling the handle, all of a sudden, surprise, hey, mm -hmm. here's candy and cookies. And Very, Anyway, I don't know why I bring that up, but no. I always really respected him. It, it, it's very interesting because the A6s, that was their tactic to go low. And we had conversations with them during Desert Shield when they were doing the Merriman strikes, and we they were part of our strikes sometimes. So, you guys are insane going low. <laughs> well, it's what we do. I said, well, I don't care what you do and what you did in Vietnam. Do you know what level of AAA concentrations they have around these target areas? A 23 millimeter goes up to 14,000 feet. That's the most lethal... They have hundreds, if not thousands, of batteries. You guys are going to get shot down. Well, okay, maybe it's what we do, but we're going to surprise them. And, oh, by the way, you're slow. Uh, you're not as fast You're not as fast as strike. Anyway, the insanity, we told them not to go low, and, well, they didn't go too much low too much more after no. night two. Well, when they lost 50% of their strike package in the airfield was shot down at night two, uh, they changed their tactic, and it just... It, see, these mindsets in culture, it takes war and death and combat to really move the needle many times. Well, when someone's job is to bang their head against the wall and you tell them it's going to hurt and they do it anyway, they just say that's their job. So, all right, Mongo. <laughs> well, you've already touched on one question I wanted to ask you, and that is, you know, life's never the same. Of course, you don't know what life would have been like if you hadn't had a make kill, but you've certainly been, you know, like you said, treated one way or the other, sometimes unfairly, but you've had opportunities and you have something, a great story. So we appreciate you sharing it with us. Um, so we want to just wrap up here real quick. First off, just 
let us know what's going on with you now and, and what the future holds. I mean, you've you got a pretty good gig going here, and, and uh, family looks happy, but what's, what's the future hold for you? I work in industry. I've been retired four years now. Uh, from the military? Yes, retired four years from the military, a little over four years. And, and by the way, my last job was my best. I didn't fly fighters, but I commanded Pacific Missile Range Facility on a beautiful island in Kauai, house on the beach, test and training range, flew the Metro Liner. It was a lot of fun. It I'll was bet. a gr- great tour with great people, and I love the, the aloha spirit from uh, my friends on Hawaii. There's a reason why most of us tend to migrate towards the defense industry. They recognize our skill set. We have security clearance, and we understand the markets and the equipment and the customer. Uh, it's hard to break into other areas unless you have your own podcast or webcast. It's hard to break into, say, oil or finance when you spent 25 or 30 years in the military. So I've worked at Lockheed Martin. I worked on 5th Gen, F-22, and F-35. I'm a huge fan of 5th Gen. Uh, it's the wave of the future. Anyone that thinks it's not the wave of the future is so wrong. They haven't talked to Chip Burke. They haven't talked to people that have flown it. These are people that are hanging on to the fourth gen. These are the A6 drivers going in at 100 feet that don't realize when they face a fifth gen aircraft, uh, there's a reason why there's a 50 to 1 kill ratio and 100 to 1 during exercises at Nellis is because it's like boxing with your eyes shut against these modern threats. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I'm very up to speed and working new technology that will equip our war fighters, uh, new weapon systems, new radars, items that will go on 5th gen, items that might go on 6th gen, whatever that might be in the future, right. and helping uh, to shape that while I save for retirement and take care of my uh, grandchildren and hope that uh, we get leaders uh in our nation that could keep us out of war and stop sending our young men and women to war. Don't you have a young daughter who is in the service? My daughter is a JG. Yeah, she's Lieutenant an officer, JG. Lieutenant JG. Yes, she is Lieutenant JG Navy. She's a supply officer and she battled back and forth. Did she want to go on aviation or supply? Uh, and uh, <laughs> quick side note, her idea of tactical naval aviation was uh, Blue Angel Air Shows sitting in a VIP tent <laughs> and coming to fly-ins when everybody's in their nicest dress and everybody comes back. Uh, she asked me about aviation you know, when she was thinking about it, and I, I talked to her about the war. She'd never heard these stories before. I talked to her about night carrier ops or cap and dropping bombs on people, and she sort of realized that although she may have the skill set to do it, she didn't really have an appetite for being in the killing business. Um, defensive business or potentially killing business. Mm-hmm. And um, so she went to Supply Corps. Well, good on her for recognizing her own self-actualization. I mean, yeah, better to do it earlier than later. Well, yeah, Mongo, on behalf of our listeners, I want to thank you for your, you said 28 years? 28 of years, yes. I want to thank you for your time today to share your story with this audience. And I want to wish you all the best in your future. You look like you've got a great thing going here in Texas and a good job and happy family. And you're still serving our country through your children. So thank you. Jello, thank you for having me. And I finally remember our times together cruising and working together when we were both Top Gun IPs back in the day. Best of luck with your uh, podcast and growing this business. Uh, There's a great audience out there for it. And if I can be a part of it in the future, please let me know. I certainly will. Yeah, it's been almost 20 years since we were on the staff. Uh, But before you throw down your microphone, I'd like to know how you got the call sign Mongo. I mean, it seems kind of obvious with your last name, but any good story there? It it is. uh, I joined the Navy in 86. Mongello is my last name. I show up at officer candidate school. I was about 30 pounds heavier. I played football in college. And I kind of look like a Mongo I, from Blazing Saddles a little bit. <laughs> it's a classic now. <laughs> yeah, just like Top Gun's a classic. That's right. My kids won't even watch Top Gun. Oh, They're dear. like, oh, it's so campy. Uh, but back then, Blazing Saddles and the Mongo character was it. And, of course, with the name and my bald head and fat face and bigger body, it you was just perfect. You didn't have either? I did. Well, they shaved oh. you at Officer, Officer oh, Kennedy sure, School. Oh, sure, okay. So Officer Kid School, I had here, you know, I had the standards uh, 70s and 80s here for okay, a while. Sure. Yeah. And uh, it stuck. And it was a couple of attempts along the way to change it, but it never really stuck. All right. Well, excellent. Yeah. Blazing Saddles. I can virtually recite that movie from start to finish. I've watched it so many hundreds of times. But Perfect. 
Awesome. All right, Mongo, unless you got any parting shots, that's going to wrap it up. Let's get out of here. Fly Navy. That was amazing. I hope you agree. I've known Mongo a long time. I've even heard that brief before in a different venue, but I've never really understood it as well as I do now. So that was impressive. Mongo, thanks again for coming on the show. And listeners, I hope you appreciated that because he took his time out to do that and give us all his story. All right, just a couple things I want to amplify. So he talked about ALSA. That is Air Land Sea Application Center. That is a joint center that agrees on making everything the same across all branches. And in this particular application, he was talking about the com brevity or communications that we use. And it should try to be the same between Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, etc. So we've gotten better at that. But as he said, we were not great at that in the early 90s. Also, there are a lot of different formations aircraft can fly in. One is echelon, which is just basically one aircraft with another one behind it, just slightly and off to the side. And then there's also the wall, where all four, in this example, aircraft are all abeam each other. Now, a box is where you would take four, or two of the four, I should say, aircraft and put them behind them so that if you were looking at them from the top, you would have one in the upper left, one in the upper right, and then again, lower left and lower right. And so it looks like the four corners of a square. So those are just different formations fighters will sometimes fly in. And everything else I think we covered pretty well. As always, the glossary tab on the website will be updated with all the different bogey, bandit, harm, nugget, sambush, ATO, all those different topics. Take a look at those. Use them in your own applications if you want. And again, our thanks to Mongo for helping explain all those. All right. Well, we're going to wrap this up. Again, thanks to Jaime Lopez and Rantam.com, who makes our Fighter Pilot Podcast unique music now. And I want to remind you that the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of myself and my guest and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components. Well, we have a new outro here in a moment. We'll let that play, but that will pretty much do it for this episode. So we'll see you next time here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. See ya. Thank you for listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Got a question for the show? Send an email to questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to check out our website at fighterpilotpodcast.com. You can also find us on all the usual social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. For exclusive Fighter Pilot Podcast content and to help support the show, visit our Patreon page. Please like, follow, and share us with your network. And if you have a moment to leave us a rating or a review on iTunes, we would greatly appreciate it.